How do you describe Anne Summer's shops? Are they sex shops? Well, they're not sex shops because you need to have a licence and we don't need a licence because of the sort of percentage of product, I suppose, that we have. But that's been quite a difficult one to navigate throughout the years. But I think it's helped the fact that we changed them from being a very male-dominated concept, if you like. Um, only 10% of our customers were women back in the early 80s. Um, we closed the stores down when I first started, but when we reopened them, we created a much more female-friendly environment. And, and so you had to deliberately navigate those laws, did you, around what is a sex shop and what isn't? Yeah, I did, because it was very vague and, and nobody really, you know, knew where to position us because, you know, the, the law was designed to... Um, Keep it off the high street. Yeah, right. and to, to restrict the number of sex shops, that the traditional sex shops that were opening up in Soho and so on, and quite rightly keep them off the high street. But we were creating something quite unique that was essentially lingerie, was aimed mainly at women, um, and that sort of, you know, it, it was difficult for councils. I mean, Britain's had a series of sexual revolutions, hasn't it, over the, over the decades? And a lot of it in recent times has been to do with the internet, changing attitudes, different attitudes towards gender and sexuality and all of those sorts mm -hmm. of things. But actually, the Anne Summers revolution, if you like, um, was a thing in itself, wasn't it? Completely, and I, I have to say it's something I am really proud of because, you know, Anne Summers uh, and, and what we did has really played a big part in culture change, you know, in... Um, what do you think you achieved? I think the main thing was empowering women in the bedroom. You know, we liberated women between the sheets. We, you know, the younger generations of today don't realise how difficult it was in the early 80s that women couldn't buy sexy underwear in the high street like you can today. It's a given. You know, we go down the high street, you see it everywhere. You couldn't then. Um, if a woman wanted to uh, spice up her marriage, she'd have to go into a sex shop that was aimed at men. That was very difficult and uncomfortable. I remember going in myself and thinking, you know, I f find this very uncomfortable environment. And that, I guess, is what really was where my inspiration came from. Now, you got into this business because your, your dad was in it. Well, I, I was originally uh, very artistic. I wanted to be involved in the creative world. Um, and I was looking for work experience. I had no intention of staying. It was very, you know, male focused in, in all ways that you can think of. And I just by chance got invited to a Pippa D party, a bit like Tupperware, but sort of clothes. Women at this party knew that I uh, was doing work experience at Anne Summers and said, you know, why don't you do Anne Summers parties? We want to be able to spice up our sex lives, but we don't want to go into a sex shop to do that. And I thought, this could be a good idea. And I, I started doing some parties myself. Eventually, I took... Just, just taking stock from the shops? Yeah, taking stock, which was quite challenging because obviously it was very much aimed at men. And I started hosting um, parties with friends that were aimed at just women, it really was quite interesting to see women at this party, and we're going back like oh, 38 years ago, passing product around like this, sort of excited, nervous, curious, all at the same time. And I just thought, there's something here. There's definitely something in this. And I, you know, by this time I'm 21, I remember taking my idea to the board, a room full of grey-suited men, Excuse me, because you're wearing, yeah, a, I'm gray wearing suit. a gray suit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but middle-aged men, and you know, delivering I'm also my no, but no, don't no, worry. you're definitely not like <laughs> <laughs> delivering my idea. And um, remember, one board member in particular standing up, threw his pen on the table, and said, "Look, this isn't going to work. Women aren't even interested in sex." And I remember thinking, "Oh my God, this obviously says a lot more about his sex life than it does about my idea." Um, but I did manage to, to get the initial funding. So what, what was Anne Summers in those days before, the sort of, before you took over? I mean, well, it was mainly... It, 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 was, it a, was basically a sex shop, was it? Or, yes, yeah. And it, it was licensed? It was four traditional uh, sex shops that were licensed, but in fairness were the, the acceptable face of the sex industry. Um, but there is no comparison in how it was then to how it is today. And, and your dad did that as you were growing up, did he? I mean... What, what did you think your dad did? And, you know, was it, was it embarrassing? 
Well, he was a, he was essentially a publisher, actually. I mean, he he only we acquired the Anne Summers stores because the person that owned it at the time went into financial difficulty um, and owed us money. What was he publishing? Oh, he he was publishing anything from. Um, Tis was comic books up to top shelf magazines, which is what he was selling to this, to the to the uh, owner then of Ann Summers. So he bought the the Ann Summers chain consisting of four stores for like ten thousand pounds, including the name. Obviously, one, the best deal we've ever done. I didn't really know what he did. I mean, you know, it was different in those days. Our parents didn't talk about their work. Mum stayed at home. She was a typical housewife. Dad went out to work. And actually, for me, my parents divorced when I was 12 years old, so I became even more estranged from him, although I sort of saw him once a week. It wasn't, you know, th times have changed. We're much more engaged with our children, aren't we? And, um, so when, when did you realise that, that that's what he did and how did, you, how did you feel about it? I mean, you know, it's an unusual thing, isn't it, if your dad It, it is unusual. I don't, I've got to be honest, I don't really remember that transition. But I do remember sort of working there for work experience and thinking, wow, you know, this is... And, and now I'm, uh, you know, um, 19, I think, I, I was working there. And so, he, so, you know, you didn't... What I mean is you didn't get your attitudes about sex and your, you know, the, your vision that sort of formed in your early 20s about trying to liberate women in the bedroom from your parents. This, this came from you. It came from me, but when I was working there for work experience, I knew how uncomfortable I felt. And that combined with this su sudden realisation that these parties could create something completely different and empowering for women really was a big inspiration for me. I say empowering for women because I made a decision right at the beginning that I wanted these to be for women only. And I could see you know, because, you know, there would be a temptation to make it, you know, for, for men and women, but I could see that could be, that could be challenging, that could be difficult. And I think it was one of the best decisions I made. What, what, because what, what do you feel the Anne Summers revolution was? I mean, how would you sum it up? I mean, we did something quite, we did something quite incredible. It wasn't about buying sexy underwear to turn them on the man in their life. It was about women suddenly feeling empowered, but feeling good about themselves. And I think that's probably one of the biggest misconceptions is that sexy underwear is for men. Well, actually, it isn't. It's for women. So but where did that come from? I mean, was that a sort of a marketing idea that then became real? Or was that an idea that you had about how women should feel that you then wanted to bring to the high street? It definitely wasn't a marketing idea because I had no business experience. And, you know, that was something that I thought for me was a big disadvantage. So that big disadvantage forced me to rely on feedback from my customers. So I was talking to my customers, you know, I was talking to the, peop the people that were, I was recruiting. I mean, I recruited 500 sales organizers in my first year. It was growing at a rapid rate. And I was talking to those women and finding out what women wanted. Um, and that really is what drove, and probably is, a, is what we do today is quite normal, but isn't what, it's not what business leaders did then. You know, we didn't listen to our customers, you know, customers weren't king. Um, things have changed dramatically and I was doing that. Um, and it was very much driven by the customer. How would you describe Britain's attitudes towards sex then in the 80s? Wow, it was very, very, it was very different. I mean, I, you know, I was probably about 25 when I was, I was arrested. Uh, I was running a, um, I had a stand at the, Bristol Women's World Exhibition, something something like that, in Women's World Exhibition in Bristol. And I had a few toys sort of discreetly located at the back. And I remember, um, you know, being arrested and the police not really knowing what to do with me. And I'm saying, well, what am I being arrested for? Well, you're running a sex shop without a license. And I said, but I, I, I'm not selling anything. I'm just displaying it. And um, they just didn't really know what to do with me. And... You know, that was the problem, is where do we p pigeonhole Anne Summers or where do we pigeonhole what Jacqueline Gold is doing? That was a, a really big challenge for them. And it was a case of if you don't pack up your stall, you know, we're going to, um, you know, we're going to caution you. But if you don't pack up your stall, we're going to press charges. But do you, do you think it was because Britain was actually sexually repressed or, or just that the law was absurd or...? 
or what you know i mean in terms of our attitudes towards sex as a society i mean those have changed a lot mm. you know in 30 years or 40 years um so just i wonder what where you think we were back in those days because that was before um you know long before you know our attitudes towards homosexuality had changed yeah. and you know all, all the all the things we take for granted now about gender and sexuality um well, that, What's not the way Britain was in the 80s, is no, it? No, but it, was a, it wasn't just about sex. It was about everything that was to do with empowering women. You know, um, it was to do with how we were treated in the workplace as much as it was about how women were treated in the bedroom, which is why, and I know that's a separate subject, which is why that's something that interests me so much. Um, you know, women have been on that journey where they've had to fight for everything that is anything to do with equality, that you know, we talk about now as being a job done, and it definitely isn't a job done. And we're still having those conversations around gender pay, um, sexual harassment. You know, it was a much bigger, a much bigger conversation. And this was just another thing that suddenly women felt empowered and men were feeling uncomfortable about it. I remember, you know, the taxi driver dropping me off at my head office saying, oh, you're not going in there, are you? I'm saying, why? What goes on in there? Well, you know what goes on in there. Or the, the telephone engineer coming... What do you think he thought went on in there? Yeah, exactly. You know, and there was visions of, you know, women walking around in thigh-high boots and... <laughs> yeah, it's not quite like that. <laughs> it's not that much fun. Um, but, you know, there was this... All of a sudden, men weren't allowed at the parties and it was all for women and women loved it they loved being able to go to the parties try the underwear on talk about their sex lives moan about their husbands or whatever it was share ideas and and try different things and suddenly it was something completely different that they'd never ever had the opportunity to explore before so you took it from four licensed shops closed them down to how many how, how did the business expand? So at our peak, 140 stores um, across the country. Um, we've actually got four routes to market. We've got the party plan division, which is doing fantastic. Um, online, uh, which is like, you know, sort of what everybody does these days. Uh, we've also got our wholesale. We supply ASOS, um, Shop Direct, Nordstrom in America, you know, Debenhams. So we're, we've got some great partnerships. You know, who'd have thought that 30 years ago that we would be so mainstream? Um, and, and, you know, it, there's still so much more opportunity to come. Does that surprise you that you're mainstream or is that, was that the aim? You know, were you trying to be a rebel when you were doing it? And were you kicking against the system deliberately? Or, or were you seeking the kind of mainstream ordinary recognition that you have now? There's two things to say about that, to answer that. First of all, I never imagined it to be as big as it is. Um, although I had this vision about empowering women, you know, I, I, I didn't realise it was at that time that it was going to be this big. It was a journey that I was going on. And it's interesting what you say about being a rebel because it wasn't so much that I was being a rebel for the, for the sake of it. I felt really passionate about what I was doing. So every time I had a challenge, and you know, another one that comes to mind is when I received a bullet through the post when I tried to open a store in, in Dublin. You know, most people I think would have backed off and thought, huh, you know, let's go somewhere else. But it really was a red rag to a ball to me because I knew that our parties were doing great in Ireland. You know, we had higher sales per head than we had in the UK. It was obvious that opening a store that there would be a success. Um, and yeah, I wanted to take it on. I, I've always been somebody that really struggles with unfair unfairness and, and you know, in just situations. And that really drove me, along with the feedback that I was getting from the customers saying, this is fantastic. Um, and just anecdotal feedback, you know, people saying to me, you know, I, I conceived my second child wearing your nurse's outfit or, or whatever. <laughs> you know, random people coming up to me and saying that was like, yeah, we're, we are doing something here. Is, is the internet inevitably going to put the Unsummer shops out of business? No. The high street shops? No. And just convert you into an online business? Yeah. I, I, no, because I... Look, first of all, there's no doubt that retail is brutal. 
I mean, it's brutal out there right now, and it's very, very difficult. Would I want to go online? No, because I think that, um, you, you know, most retailers will want a presence on the high street. Yes, we are consolidating stores down, and we can no longer have those. Do you remember we talked about lost leaders in the past uh, 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 and how important it was to have a presence? Um, but obviously, you know, the, the landscape is changing, but we still want to have a presence on the high street, but they have to be... Um, Profit-making stores. We can't, you know, we can't do it any other way. How many stores have you got now? You, you, you had 140 at the peak. Yes, we are 119. Right. And so, is that is that inevitably going to go down? Do you think? Yeah, I think it will. I think you know, realistically, you know, we, we want to keep as many as we can, but we're we're pretty much we're close to where we want to be. But you'll see that with with all stores, and I, you know, we don't want to be a new look where we're just suddenly having to completely transform and, and go online only. That's but is not it more so with your, your end of the market in that it's just less embarrassing and you don't have to walk into a shop? And Because presumably some people are still embarrassed to walk into a Anne Summers. You know, it's not the same as walking into a Debenhams. No, I mean, the great thing about the parties is they actually were an induction into the brand. You know, people came to the parties and then wanted to go in store. And, you know, we're going through a whole rebranding transition now, which our stores are you know are are changing and the imagery is changing we're doing everything through a female lens you know uh we want to be relatable to our customers and aspirational at the same time as and still we want our customers to look in the mirror and think wow i look hot you know what i'm seeing so it's a much it's a different it's a different way of working you know we're emotionally engaged with our customers you know, days of old where you were like a transactional only way of working, you know, we have to be, these days, the successful brands are going to be the ones that have a purpose, you know, and a purpose that our customers can really relate to. Just going back to Ireland, do you know who sent you the bullet? Who did you think it had come from? Yeah, I mean, it, it, listen, it, the implication was that it was the IRA, but I don't believe it was. You know, people just... It, you know, Ireland have, have gone through a different journey, haven't they? And our stores, you know, have been much more, they've been successful in, in Ireland, but you'll always get those radicals that have a different view of how things should be. And did you take it as a serious threat? Yeah, violence? I took, well, I, I, what I did was I decided to go ahead with the shop opening. I mean, I had the council, Dublin's corporation, come over and meet with me before I received the bullet. And they were saying to me, you know, we can't be held responsible for what might happen to you. So... It was quite chilling when that actually did happen. I then went on the Late Late Show. I think it was the first media thing I'd ever done. Um, and, you know, I believe changed people's opinions in Ireland. Um, and it was great, you know, the Dublin store that we opened, which admittedly was in a, a, um, a controversial location on O'Donnell, o, o, O'Donnell Street, O'Connell Street, O'Connell, right opposite the GPO building. Um, but that is one of our top three performing stores now, the, the, the main flagship store in Ireland. It's, it's moved now. To have 10,000 10, people through the door on the first day of opening, signing a petition because they wanted the store there, you know, that store has gone on to be uh, hugely successful. What do you think of our sexual culture now? Yeah, I think the biggest challenge is the internet. You know, I have a nine-year-old daughter, so, you know, like any parent, um, and she's bright. She constantly knows how to unravel the uh, restrictions. And, you know, I'm constantly looking at her history, and that's, you know, that's difficult. Um, but I think on our high streets, I think it's, you know, I think we've got the balance right. Um, I think that there's a whole piece around um, LGBT and making sure that, Brands are embracing diversity of all levels. But do you, do you think Anne Summers has contributed to the current sexual culture that we live in? And, and what do you think the contribution has been? You talked about how you think you, you, help, you helped liberate women in the bedroom, if you like, and change women's attitudes towards sex in the 80s. What, what do you think your contribution is now to our current sexual culture? If we bring it right up to date... It is still about empowering women in the bedroom, but in a different way. It's much more about body image, about being body confident. But being sexually confident is an individual thing. It's not, it's ageless. It's about, and it changes throughout a, women, a woman's uh, lifetime. 
you know, and I think it's about being on that journey with her and realising that the challenges she faces today about sexual confidence are different. You know, social media, for example, has a massive influence on how a woman feels about the way she looks. Um, Do you think young people are too sexualised? As a mother, I would say in some cases, yes, I think they are. And I think the images on social media can be can be difficult. You know, we want we don't want our children to be worried, you know, about the way they look and are they skinny enough. You know, I think those are challenges. I think the whole the whole way the dating game has changed is another, you know, it's another concern as a parent, but also as a retailer who realises that women, you know, has different challenges in relationships and the expectations of that relationship. Um, you know, and it's important that we as a retailer understand all of that. Because if you're, if you're projecting yourself online, you know, and that's how a lot of people are meeting their dates, it is all about that look, isn't it, and the image. So do you think we're overall getting it right or wrong? I mean, you know, because a lot of people think everything, you know, everything's out of the, back, the you know, out, out of the bottle. Um, and everything is available online, um, in, you know, culturally to very young people. And that, you know, the normalisation of sex, you know, in the high street and everywhere else is all part of that. I just sort of wonder whether you think I mean, you've I've, contributed to that. Or, yeah, I see know. what you're saying. Um, you know, I think as retailers, I think generally retailers are under the microscope. So I think that whenever there is, you know, a brand that sells something that, you know, the general public feels is over sexualization I think brands are very quick to respond to that. I mean, certainly Ann Summers, you know, as my own company, you know, we've always approached uh, the way we display our products in store, you know, in a very responsible way. Um, and, you know, even children coming into store, we wouldn't let, for example, a group of young girls come into our store unaccompanied by an adult. But if, you know, a mum comes in with a pushchair, you know, we make... Um, you know, sensible decisions and, and allow parents to make that, that decision themselves. So I think you can only operate in a, in, in a responsible way, and I think most retailers do. Do you think we've got the age of consent right at 16? Wow. Um, listen, you know, do I? I mean, it's not something... It's something that we, we're used to, aren't we, as a society? We think that's right. Um, as a parent, when right sitting here right now, I know my husband's already building the tower. <laughs> um, you know, I'd probably say if I was talking about my own daughter, absolutely not. Of course not. She can't get, you know, absolutely not. Because <laughs> <laughs> it, would, it would affect your retail environment, wouldn't it? I mean, you know, if we were in, do you have stores in, 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 in the Netherlands, for example? No. Or, no. No, I mean, if you did, you'd be operating in a very different environment there, wouldn't you, in terms yeah, but of you have to adapt. who you were selling to? And, and you do have to adapt to cultures. I mean, I've had stores in Kuwait. I know, you know, I know all about adapting. Um, How do you sell sex toys in Kuwait? Well, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> but I understand that the women that wear yashmaks have the most beautiful sexy underwear in the world. So... Uh, yeah, you know, you have to adapt to cultures and you have to respect cultures and, and you know, navigate your way around that. Um, and you need the expertise to help support you with that because, you know, it's not as easy to go into international countries as you think it's going to be. So do you think you, you could operate, you know, within different sort of sexual codes, if you like? Of course you can. And, you know, we're, we're, we're sort of knee deep in our... Um, our strategy for the US, for example, right now. And, it, you know, we're, we're still in two minds. Do we go, you know, lingerie only or do we go a mixture of lingerie and toys? You have to you have to go with the, you know, with what's right for that culture. And within that, you have to act in a responsible way, which I'm confident we always have done. How prudish do you think Britain is now? Nowhere near as prudish as it was um, nearly 40 years ago. I don't know. I think the further north you go as well, the less prudish we are. Um, you know, uh, why do you say that? Because that's just the evidence of sales and what's purchased, and you know. Um, Tell me what I want to know. What's the difference? <laughs> why, what are people buying in the north and they're not buying in? The... Oh, I can't specifically <laughs> say what they are, but there is no doubt that you know, in the early days when we were developing and the parties, we, you know, we'd have pockets in Glasgow and Edinburgh that were just flourishing, um, and definitely the more north you go, the more relaxed. You know, people are the less inhibited. I think we're quite, you know, we can be a little bit um, uptight here in the South. 
Are you saying to different social classes as well in different parts oh, of the country? Oh, totally. Uh, uh, yes. Or, or, I mean, or is it all across is what I mean? I mean, you know, yeah, is, it, is it, it more working class in some areas, more middle class in other areas? It's, it's across the board. Um, our biggest challenge at the moment is, you know, one of the great things about Anne Summers is that we, we have amazing brand recognition, you know, 94%, you know, equivalent of Nike. What brand wouldn't love to have that? But we have an outdated perception of our brands in some ways that you know has has really been part of my sort of rebranding project that i'm very passionate about um and it's about telling you know new customers hey we've changed but also saying to our current customers we're still the brand that you know and love um and that's you know and i think a lot of brands actually for different reasons are also having to realize that they need to modernize their brands and move, move forward. And are you are you more welcoming towards men now? I mean is that is that the thing where you sort of go full circle <laughs> having having kicked the men out that you kind of need to welcome them back in? Um, I think that you know we are essentially a female brand in the sense that 80% of our our customers that come into our stores are women. Um, but we also love men and we want men to come into our stores too. So you know it's about Where, where are men supposed to buy their things then? It's about making men feel comfortable because men feel a bit clumsy, don't they, going into not just Dan Summers, but any lingerie store. So it is about making, feel men, making men feel comfortable coming into the store. And certainly at weekends, we do see more men coming out with their, their partners. Or at Christmas. Or... Oh, and, oh, well, Christmas Eve. Hey, we see a lot of men in store. How many problems do you run into with complaints now? I mean, you know, you've had your share over the years of people not liking what you do. Um, do you still have that? Not really. I mean, you know, it's just, it's, it's different. I think Ann Summers is a heritage brand now on the high street. And I don't think people perceive Ann Summers in the way they, they did years ago. And I think people understand, you know, what we stand for and why we're here. Um, so I think those, are, are, those outdated percep perceptions are becoming less and less. What about, um, I mean, you, you had a problem, didn't you, with, with, a, with a complaint from, um, from a, a Muslim group over a doll that you sold in the, in the shop. Um, what was it called? Must Have a Shack or something yeah. like that, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Um, I mean, what did you learn from that? <laughs> that was a long time ago now, but it was part of our, I guess it was part of our learning journey in the sense that we had quite a few controversial windows. And in the past, you know, I guess that was part of our strategy. We, we didn't, you know, we were a medium-sized business that doesn't have deep po pockets. Deliberately provocative. We don't have deep pockets to invest in uh, above-the-line advertising. And, you know, those controversial windows certainly caused quite a stir. Uh, although some of those, obviously that wasn't a window, but some of those... Um, I mean, that was actually, that wasn't even a window. That was just a bit of fun. That was, uh, you know, but... So were but, you doing things for the publicity but to cause the stir? The windows, yes, or? but not that product. So that product, it was just a bit of fun. It was a hen night product. Um, you can't do those sort of things now. You know, times have changed and retailers move with those times and, and you know, things are, di are, are different and we you know, we find fun in other ways. And do you have residents complaining about you at all? Or, you know, in, 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 in town centres or anything like that? No, or, no, no. That, that, that's no think, we don't have anything like that now. Um, you know, there were many challenges at the begin, beginning, whether it be councils or, yeah, maybe some residents complaining about windows. You know, we've done some, um, you know, some provocative windows. Every retailer wants their USP and we wanted our USP and we were always doing a nod to something or we were being tongue in cheek. I'm definitely not ashamed of anything we've done in the past because it's been part of that, part of that journey. Um, but for me now, it's much more about empowering women, you know, and, and building confidence in women. I think it's something that um, is much more exciting. We've touched on the problems in the high streets in terms of the challenge of online shopping and what that's going to do to high street stores. What about the, you know, the big impending business challenge of the next year, which is Brexit? How do you think that's going to affect what you're doing on the high street? Yeah, I think there are a number of challenges for retail. I don't think it is just Brexit. I think certainly economic factors, I include that in there. You know, even sanctions on Russia by Trump are, are causing issues. 
I think the legislative burdens that we face, whether that be business rates, national living wage, apprenticeship levy, I think that, um, you, you know, you mentioned earlier about the dominance of online and how that impacts retail. Uh, and I think that's a big problem, actually, but not so much about, you know, the pace in which it's growing, because that's obviously driven by the consumer. But the, and we've heard a lot about it lately, but the, you know, we're not trading from a, a fair level playing field. And that, for me, is a big problem. Well, let's just break those down then. I mean, so, so business rates... The argument there is that online stores don't have to pay business rates, so they've got a natural advantage. Business rates do raise billions of pounds for the Treasury. Um, what do you think should happen? I really like um, Justin King's idea, actually, where um, you halve business rates and you increase VAT, because I think the, the reality is retailers aren't going to put their prices up, so it's not going to affect the consumer. It does mean that we, you know, we're all paying a fairer, you know, online are obviously having to pay more of their share. And I think the general public businesses and the public are irritated by the fact that there is a, an element of them not paying their fair share of the tax uh, burden. And at the same time, um, we significantly reduce uh, business rates. We're seeing so many heritage businesses you know, go under, whether we just currently we're talking about Heiser Fraser, you know, we've had Toys R Us, we've had so many, and starting, of course, with the with Woolworths right at the, the start of all of this. This cannot carry on, you know, unless we want to see our high streets return to residential, something has to change. But, but why do you think you're immune from that? You know, because you don't think your high street stores are going to disappear, do you? I think we've always run a tight ship. Um... I think that we are having to consolidate stores. Of course, we've already reduced our stores. You know, there's, there's other things that retailers should be doing to make their stores attractive. You know, that's about the, you know, it's, it's not good enough anymore just to have a great service. It's about making sure that you remove all of the pain points at every touch point of the customer journey. So those are the type of things. And I think it's also about making sure that we restructure our businesses in a way that... Um, obviously it's easy to say putting the customer at the, at the core of the business but we do really have to do that you know we have a, a we have a customer department we have a, a board director that's just devoted to the customer so that we can make sure that there is that seamless experience right across all our channels so do you think those brands that have gone out of business could have been saved with better management I think there's a number of things. I think that certainly not modernising their brand. If you're talking about, say, somewhere like somebody like Woolworths or BHS, then yes, that would fall into that category. But I think the financial, the main three things, that would be one. I think the financial burdens are, are crippling on, on retail at the moment. And I think that unfair, you know, the dominance of online and that unfair playing field plays a massive part. Of course, there are things that the government can do as well as reducing business rates or addressing business rates. You know, free parking for a start. And that's a challenging one. Again, it's a revenue. Uh, you know, that's important from the In government. In town centres. Yeah. yeah, but if we want to drag people away from the keyboard in, into the town centres, then you've got to have free parking. You've got to have a great leisure experience that becomes a family stroke community hub and it's somewhere that they want to go to for the afternoon. Would a no-deal Brexit affect you? I am worried about Brexit. I wanted to remain because I think it was good for business. Um, I think that, you know, yes, we, it is uncertain right now. And I think we, we, we will go through a period. I think retail is expected to grow about 1% this year. I think that will probably stabilise and be neutral for for a while. But how would it affect your actual business? Can you just explain? I mean, you know, would it affect your supply chains or where does most of your stuff come in from? Um, China, Hong Kong. So in that respect, you're not affected? So, you know, by, by, by a no-deal well, Brexit, it doesn't really make any affected, difference to your, to your supply yeah, chains? Yeah, not to the supply chains, but to margins. Yes, we're affected by that. But, you know, we have to be creative and we have to work at that and we have to find solutions and that's what we'll do. Are you selling into Europe? I mean, we, do you have customers in Europe we, who are buying from you? Yeah, I mean, we have online presence in Europe. We trade We trade in the US is a, a much bigger because we're with Nordstrom. Um, 
and you know we will navigate that we that's what we have to do that's what all retailers have to do but equally there are opportunities there opportunities in the US we don't sort of see international expansion as a you know, as a, a bogeyman, that's an opportunity. And that's it's interesting that you're, you, that you're a Remainer, given that your business isn't as dependent on European structures as others are. You know, yours is the kind of business that a lot of the Brexiteers have been saying, well, you know, people who are importing from China don't need to worry. If you're doing business with America, you don't need to worry. You know, we'll just get on with it. But actually, you didn't think Brexit was a good idea. I mean, I just was looking at the bigger picture. You know, I saw... I don't want to be isolated. Uh, you know, I think it's good to be part of... Um, I thought it was good to be part of a union and all of the deals that were achieved on the back of that. And the thought of having to renegotiate, I think it was something like 53, um, you know, different deals, I think is, you know, do we really know what we're letting our, ourselves in for? Um, and so far, I don't think... And I, I look, I don't want, don't want to sit here and be an I told you so. I definitely don't. But, you know... It's not looking good at the moment. As a, as a big high street business, what, what do you think about the voices of business that we always hear from, whether it's the CBI or, you know, the Federation of Small Businesses? I mean, do they really represent British business? Oh, good question. Um, I think the difficulty is not so much about them. I think they do their very best to represent business. I just think the difficulty is whether we are being listened to or those organisations are being listened to by those people in government that really can, you know, listen. They're representing retailers, after all. Um, but I think... Do you feel they represent you? You know, when they go in to see ministers, do you feel that they are telling ministers what you think? Absolutely. Well? I mean, I've been in... Because I've... they're often portrayed by politicians as, you know, oh, they're just lob you know, they're, they're, they're lobbyists with their own agendas and all the rest of it. They don't, they don't really speak for business. As far as you're concerned, they do. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I've been to round tables with the BRC, for example, who do a fantastic job in representing retail. Um, I think the problem is that government will see, at the moment, I think they see retail as an easy, an easy way to uh, put on another tax um, and add the burden without... And, and it's, it's, it's short-sighted. It, it's unfair and short-sighted unnecessarily complicated and retail as we can see with our own eyes is seriously paying the price do you feel that you're you're part of the establishment now because you're a big business boss you're very wealthy you're sort of you've got an honor um are you, are you part of the elite uh, i don't see myself in that way no um you know we still have battles to fight we still have people to try and influence and i'm always trying to do the best for my company the best for my employees best for my customers those are the things that really matter to me um and you know i have uh at times been you know banging on uh ministers doors and trying to get change and it's a frustrating process. There is no doubt about that. And I would like to see much more engagement with businesses and listening to businesses. And, uh, you know, that's a, it is a very frustrating, drawn out process that often doesn't go anywhere. Just give me an example of that. I mean, when, when have you had to bang on ministers' doors to try and get something changed? Uh, and well, how, how's it gone? Hey. <laughs> Um, I think, uh, listen, I met with Sajid, uh, with, um, Sajid Javid, for example, um, and I think at the time I was talking about the actual overall problem of listening, just listening, you know. These, when he was the business secretary. Yeah, yeah. just listening. And, um, you know, that whether it be about business rates, whether it be about Sunday trading, you know, having conversations about Sunday trading. Everybody is scared of their shadow. Everybody is just scared of making a decision. You know, the, the web operates 365 days a year, 24-7, 20, and retailers have to compete with that. That cannot be right. And did you get the sense that you were being listened to, that they understood I pause because um, there's a lot of, you know, though I didn't come away feeling confident. And I got very frustrated and I had lots of meetings, but didn't come away feeling confident that I was, 
you know, this was stuff they would have heard before, not just by me, but by other retail leaders. But that doesn't mean we stop banging the drum. We keep going. Because a Conservative government traditionally, you know, sees itself as the party of business, the the party that understands business. Um, Is that how you see it? It doesn't sound like it. I think definitely, for me, Conservatives would definitely represent business better than Labour would, if we're talking about the two major parties. So, um, you know, not that I... Yeah, definitely, they represent retail better. Am I happy with everything they do? No. There are plenty of people in business who say, you know, this, this government is not, is not the party of business right now. I'm just wondering whether you're one of those people or, you know, is it that you're just dissatisfied with certain things? No, I don't. I think, you know, understandably, we all know government is completely distracted by Brexit. And, you know, you could make a case that that is the right thing that they should be focusing on. Um, But I think that, you know, you can't neglect business as usual or the stroke day job. And there are certain things that are fundamental. And if we're talking about anything that's fundamental, it has to be business rates. You know, this is a a complicated, outdated system that is no longer fit for purpose. We are all seeing the high streets um, collapse before our eyes. And if we don't want that to continue, then something radical has to change. Do you think that's the real cost of Brexit, that it's distracting ministers and government from tackling other things that need to be tackled? Of course. Of course it is. Um, I think that's, that's absolutely the case. But we are where we are. Um, and I guess, to a degree, some of that is to be expected. W- will you, would you join the call for, an, for another vote, another think, the people's vote? What do you think of that idea? For me, it's all about stability. I think if you did do another vote, another referendum, I think, I think it would go the other way, frankly. Why do you say that? Um, because I think a lot of people are thinking, God, this isn't what I... You know, I think people were just focused on immigration. I don't think they realised, understandably, by the way, and this is not a criticism. I, I mean, I, I was actually a big fan of David Cameron, but I think he made the wrong call in calling the referendum in the first place because that's why we have a government, to make those type of decisions. Um, And we don't want to be burdened with a decision that we don't know enough about. And I think that most people would say, you know, I didn't know enough about it. I made the call based on immigration, which was a big concern to me. Um, And now we're seeing what that impact is likely to have on business and ultimately the economy. And you think we'd get a different result? I think we would. But that doesn't mean I think we should go for the referendum again, because I think that could equally be... Uh, very unsettling and and we need stability so that's interesting I mean what what, so you what do you think of the idea of a second vote I mean do you think we should have one or not I'm on the fence I don't you know I need to give this more thought Uh, it's it is it's a tricky one because I mean if you were against Brexit and you think the country has changed its mind why wouldn't you think a second vote is a good idea? Because not everybody's changed their mind, have they? And, you know, the thing is, it was a close call. You know, it was a close call. I know that the, uh, the Brexiteers won. Of course they did, and I respect that. But it was close. It was only a couple of one or two percent in it. Um, do I think it would change now? Yeah, I do. Do I think it's right to have a referendum? Right now, I feel st- stability is more important. That's really interesting. Um, I ask all my guests what they think is the most controversial idea they have for changing the world. Do you have one? For me, it's about what we need to change to make women more empowered. Um, And I have a couple of potentially controversial thoughts. Boys are brought up to be brave. Girls are are brought up to be perfect. Which for me, it's no wonder that women then play down their achievements uh, in later life. Another one for me is that I think we've got to stop model coddling our boys as we bring them up. And I think there is a tendency. Um, and I, I, I have a daughter, Scarlett, but Scarlett was a twin and I had a boy as well. And I'm sure if I'd have brought up Alfie, um, I would have model coddled him as well. But the problem with that is by the time 
a man grows up and reaches the boardroom, it's no wonder that he expects the women to pour the tea. And that's something that, you know, I really think that changing the world where women are concerned, you know, it's not just about what we do in the workplace. It's also about that social conditioning and how goals are brought up, um, you know, from a very young age. I don't want to pry at all. Um, is, is there, but is there any more you could tell me about Alfie? Yes, so my, I was pregnant with twins and I had, uh, I didn't know what I was having, but I knew that one baby had a fatal abnormality and wasn't expected to survive the pregnancy. Um, and actually I was pregnant with a boy and a girl and my son did survive the pregnancy and was born and lived for eight months. Um, so he was very poorly and very sick. Um, and that obviously was a very, very challenging time for our family. Um, and, you know, we have a, our nine-year-old daughter now and Alfie still plays a very big part in our lives in different ways. Um, but these are just, you know, one of the many challenges that sometimes parents sadly have to go through. Did you have any choice? I mean, was, was there a deliberate decision that you had to take along that way? It was difficult because we obviously did have, a, a no, we did have the choice of a selective termination. Um, and bearing in mind, at that point, they didn't think he would survive the pregnancy, let alone the birth. So it would have been a reasonable one to take, but there was a risk to the other baby. And, you know, we thought that nature would take its course. Um, so it was very difficult for me because I grieved for my baby while he was in the womb. So then when he was born, that was quite a shock for me. Um, and then of course to lose him again, to then have to grieve for your baby twice, is, I just, you know, it's almost impossible to explain how that, how that feels. It makes us who we are, the sorts of experiences, I suppose. Mm. Jacqueline Gold, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. For joining us on Ways to Change the World.